Okay, it's on now. Okay. Welcome to worship, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Laura Hill, and be sure to check in if you're on Facebook. And right now, we're joining online. Thank you. Also, lift up your prayer requests in the comments, and we will try to get to all of them during our sharing of your prayer requests. If you're joining today in person, Please take a moment to fill out one of our welcome and attendance sheets in your pews, which also has space to lift up your prayer request. There's a spot for your email as well, if you like, to get our weekly newsletter of what's going on in the life of St. John's. Finally, take a look at the back of your bulletin to see our announcements of what's going on in the life of our church. We have lots of good stuff going on, and you'll want to be a part of it. And now, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, once again, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And good morning, darling niece. I'm running the, the live stream today, so I'll see other people's good mornings. Uh, whether this is your first time here, or maybe it's been a while, or you were here just last week, welcome, welcome back, and I hope that you have felt welcome. We have a place to put your prayer requests in the middle of the doors in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, if you'd like to put them down, I'll read them during our time of prayer. And that reminds me, since I'm running the, the, the camera this morning, if someone during our time of uh, joys and concerns and sharing prayer requests, if you would flip over to uh, Facebook, if you know how to get to our page, and just look in the comments and see uh, if we have any in there. As always, we have our fellowship time right after worship, and that's located in the sanctuary, which is right up here, <laughs> and then over to your left. Uh, we continue to collect warm weather items for Pete's Place, the, the local homeless shelter, and that's going to be going uh, through March. We've had some people write, uh, uh, Marie is our faithful deliverer uh, over to Pete's Place, and, and we've had an uptick in more donations and whatnot. So thank you so much, and let's keep that going. Uh, we have, uh, if you noticed in the back, Ancient Traditions for Contemporary People. What is that? It's February 10th from 1 to 4. It will be in our chapel, and it's a contemplative half-day retreat in preparing our hearts for Lent. It's a combination of listening. It's a combination of listening to our hearts, listening to each other, and then being guided by Carol Warwichuk and Sue King. So we hope that you'll join us there. And speaking of Lent, be on the lookout for our Lent schedule, which will begin on Wednesday, February 14th, which is Ash Wednesday. And I can tell you that ashes and pancakes are being claimed. And so that'll be a lot of fun. But today, we've gathered, we open up our worship bulletins, moving out of the stands. Halftime! Huh? Here we are to worship. What does worship look like if we're thinking of it as a, as a halftime show? Is that blasphemous? Is that heretical? We'll see by the end of the service, right? So let's prepare our hearts to worship, for that is why we have gathered during our time of prelude. Let us prepare our hearts to, to sing God's praises, to hear prayers and say prayers, to hear God's good word for us today. Will you join with me? <laughs>
our help for strength. We make a joyful noise to the Lord along with all the earth. We worship the Lord with gladness and commit to his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. We are made by God and the sheep of God's pasture. Let us enter God's gates with thanksgiving, God's courts with praise, giving thanks to blessings in the holy name. Our opening hymn is Come Christians Join to Sing 158. <coughs> that I hear in there. Mary, Jane and Dave, Wendy and Catherine. We say, Lord, hear our prayers for healing. We, we give thanksgiving for, for healing that we have seen and that we have experienced with you. We pray now, especially where right now one of our folks, Bud, finds himself in the ER because he fell this morning. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers of asking for healing and comfort. Hear our prayers of asking and searching out God, what am I going to do to help? We have others up here. We lift up uh, Peggy. We lift, we lift up Peggy. Um, we lift up Peggy uh, for the loss of her sister. Her sister Sue passed away yesterday. Peggy Corman. Corman. Um, our son, Al, as he contemplates a big life change. That was the prayer there. Joan and Al, do you have prayer requests this morning? Well, you know, uh, this week's monster. We and lift up praise and prayers. Getting longer. Yeah. yeah. Praise and prayers for moisture. I, I'm grateful I have Alan. Oh, 
we lift up a prayer of thanksgiving for Alan in particular, but then all of those people that are our companions and friends and brothers and sisters and loves in our life. Amen? Amen. As always, let's go to God in prayer and join our hearts together for a time of silent prayer, a time just to breathe, a time to listen. <coughs> Let us pray. Here we are to worship. Worship you as mighty creator, as mighty redeemer and savior, as the mighty and guiding sustainer. We humble ourselves before you in worship. We can sing praises like, Come, Christians, join to sing. We can join our voices together in calls to worship. We can do all of those outward things that you ask and call for a sincere heart under dirty all of them. So Lord, help us with our sincere hearts. Help us, O oh Lord, with hearts that are insincere. No matter how we came in this morning, let us just take a moment and celebrate the opportunity to breathe to listen, to look to our right and left and see our brothers and sisters in Christ, all wanting to be focused on you. So Lord, help us be humble. Let us submit our hearts to you and take this time to be vulnerable with our hearts. In that vulnerability, Lord, we also lift up bold, trusting prayer requests to you. Prayer requests, asking for healing, offering up thanksgiving to you for healing that has taken place. We lift up off ongoing recovery. We lift up those who are facing big life changes. We lift up those who find themselves in such a tender moment in the midst of loss of loved ones. And we know that radiating out, there are many prayer requests for many hurts and joys alike throughout this world. Lord, may we be in tune with the resonance of your praise and will. In the ways that we have been broken down over the course of this last week, help us be mended back together in your love and grace, even <clears throat> if we have been the ones doing the breaking, whether it's been the breaking down of ourselves or breaking down of others. Lord, hear our prayers, asking, receiving, offering forgiveness. Through it all, through the meantime of our lives of faith, we remember the constant prayer that your Son taught the disciples, a prayer that we say even now, in this time of worship, that we have set aside for you, Lord, hear our prayers. Prayers of maybe it's the assurance that we need in saying it out loud. Maybe someone to our right and left is struggling and they need to hear another's faith and assurance. We say it all the same, looking inward, outward, and upwards. We remember evermore that you are indeed our Father, who art in heaven. And hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Like to invite. Lord, Lord, for our first scripture reading. Maybe it's a passage that you've heard before, but it's been a while. Maybe it's brand new to you. But it's about a burning bush that isn't burned. It's about a revealing of a divine name. All that will come. Hear these words 
ancient words and yet let them fall fresh upon your hearts and ears. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him of the, of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. The divine name was revealed. But Moses said to God, I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they asked, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. This is the word of God, the people of God, and we say, Thank Thanks you, God. God. Name for all generations, and yet here we are gathered today. All right, Dave, is my guitar on? All right, let's all rise as we are able. And just as Moses said, Here I am, you have my attention. Let us sing together. Here I am to worship. That's in your green book if you want to follow along, and it's also on the screens. Thank you. 
we come into this time of uh, asking for God, we pour out God's blessings on what we have been offered back in acts of worship. I want to give you an update on our finances. Uh, so we had we had another change this week. Uh, we continue to look for a new bookkeeper. We had hired Dan March at the end of December, and we had to unfortunately let Dan go this week. It wasn't going to, to work out. And so we are back to square one. But square one, and all the pieces coming together, the very faithful uh, SPRC Staff Parish Relations Committee, I'm excited to announce that we have a really strong applicant uh, and we'll be interviewing that person tomorrow. In the meantime, I want to give the assurance that obviously every penny that is given, every bit of our finances and time and effort all coming together is safe and secure. We're just looking for somebody to help us get on track in all of our budgeting and, and everything like that. We have all the budgets in place, we just have to update all of them. And that also includes our end-of-year giving statements. We have not received an end-of-year giving statements, and we are going to be working diligently to get those together. I appreciate and ask even more for your patience and your grace. Is that going to be all right? Amen. Thank you. Lord, will you lead us in the time of prayer? Awesome, God. You sent Jesus to teach people first <coughs> the power of your love, grace, and authority. Jesus washed away unclean spirits and performed countless other miracles so that even the faithless would experience your love. You call us to be mindful and vigilant of the extraordinary miracles that you continue to work in our lives today. May this offer of your ministries that show others your miraculous love grace and authority. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Congregations, we would like for you to help us this morning on our anthem. So if you will pull out your song sheet that came with your bulletin, um, we would like for you to sing verse 1 with us and verse 3. And on verse 3, if you will stand to sing verse 3. We appreciate if you will help us. This is a great melody from Hulk's uh, Planets of Jupiter.
more about some of you. Sometimes we're quarterbacking, sometimes we're the center, sometimes we're running water onto the field for folks, right? Yeah, yeah. The big arena is the kingdom of God. The team is on the field. There are people in the stands watching, spectating, and they have the opportunity to jump on the field and get in the game anytime. Today, over this arena, let's think of God watching over all. God's watching the game, overseeing watching us worship. In this series, the opponents that we have, they change from week to week also. Let's see if we can find some, too. Now, week one, our opponent was apathy. Week two, that rugged individualism and thoughts of, eh, someone else will do it. <coughs> Those are the opponents. Let's see what opponents we might have today. Wait, can you have opponents in worship? Today is the halftime show. Everybody loves a good halftime show. And even when they're really bad halftime shows, they get just as much publicity and are talked about, right? Yeah. And 
we're going to play with our imagery again a little bit today. The halftime show for us, I want us to think of as worship. Worship is when we pause periodically in our ongoing ministries and missions and service game to express our joys and our hopes, express our faith, and maybe it's through pain and crisis too. We express it all to God. We bring it to God in this place and in this time. Worship is about expressing faith individually and collectively. It's about bringing an honest expression of faith to God in a moment on the occasions of worship. And I hope that you've brought that today. And I hope on behalf of those who, who plan worship that we've put together a worthy outline for the worship halftime show today. It's important stuff, isn't it? When we think about stepping onto the field to worship, to pause our lives and other various ministries to worship, I hope you step onto the field the way that you've heard Moses stepping before the burning and yet not burning bush. What a wonderful setup today, the burning and not yet burning bush. Stepping into a worship setting, it should grab your attention. It should refocus you. Stepping onto the field in this time is having a mindset, a heart set, <clears throat> of stepping on the holy ground. This building is this during this time, a holy place. It's not a holier place than any other, but it is a holy place and time right now. And it's a holy space because we specifically invite and acknowledge God's presence in this time. No, I. I didn't see anyone this morning, to my knowledge, remove their shoes physically to, to prepare to encounter God. But it would have been okay if you did. That's what these wonderful shoes leading up to the altar are all about today. That's what they represent, removing of shoes, seeing a bush burning, and yet not burning, getting your attention. Removing shoes and acknowledging that we are on holy ground to encounter God. Removing shoes was a sign of submitting oneself to God, being humble, allowing yourself to be vulnerable and experience the presence of God in the moment. And so, if literally removing your shoes is what gets your attention focused and ready to encounter God today, I say go for it. It's not too late. If you want to bend them right down and slip those puppies off and bring them up here, you go ahead and do it. Take those shoes off. Well, but there are also other things, right? Maybe preparing your attention and heart is looking to your right and left and greeting people, welcoming them into this space. Maybe your way is to ritually turn off your cell phone. Not necessarily as a courtesy to others, sure it's a courtesy to others, but as a courtesy to yourself. To turn off the outside notifications that can distract you from worshiping God, along with others too. Maybe you come into the sanctuary and pick up a Bible or a hymn and read holy words to prepare yourself. Maybe, maybe you come to a choir rehearsal to get your head and heart a game of worship for that day. And maybe you came in feeling adrift and don't even know how to prepare for worship. Maybe that's an ongoing thing. That's great if it's you today. You have a cloud of witnesses around you that can show you, that can help you participate, that can help you prepare. Because once Moses' attention was fixed and ready, he encountered God at a crucial moment in time that prepared him for great things and great wisdom and great teaching from God. That God was going to redeem God's people. And in the holy name, the revealing of the divine name. That name is timeless. And we can see that in the translation that I am. The divine name translates typically either as I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. I am that I am. Who is the I am to you this morning? Have you thought about it to help you worship who I am? Well, that's what the writer of Hebrews was helping people to in the passage that I'm about to read.
Pursue with peace. Pursue peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and through it many become defiled. See to it that no one becomes like Esau, an immoral and godless person who sold his birthright for a single meal. In other translations, he's called a fornicator, a fornicator who sold his birthright for a single meal. You know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, even though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it should be stoned to death. That's another reference to the Old Testament and the holy mountain. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Man, what a halftime show so far, right? See to it that see that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who rewards them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth. Now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. This too is the word of God for the people of God we can say together. Thank you, Thank you. God. Thank you. What we get here is a whole bunch of different things because I never preach off of one verse of scripture, right? But I want us to focus on the big picture and then also how it ends with the therefore about worship. Here, this passage, it, it was a warning to focus solely on God, to be holy, to be made holy through Jesus Christ, and never miss an opportunity to praise and express that. Let all the other parts of creation be shaken off so that all that's left in your world is your connection to God through Christ, whether it is this day or talking about the final day of the Lord. That's what prepares us to offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. The writer of Hebrews went in the bold direction to even call this lack of focus, this lack of pursuing peace and holiness. The writer in the Greek calls it fornication which here means more idolatry than what we normally think of as sexual sin. Idolatry is often expressed in the Bible as adultery and fornication, which can be confusing, right, if we only apply our normal and current meanings. But I want you to think idolatry. The author here uses the example of Esau from the Old Testament. Esau is used here as an example because he let self-ambition become the center of his life and not God's will and blessings. He only wanted to trick and receive God's blessings, and that's not how it works. The author of Hebrew goes so far as to basically say, whatever you are putting before God in this life will become or already has become the God of your choosing and the focus of your worship, not the one true God. And that's idolatry. That's bold, but it's the truth. An idolater is one who is tempted by and worshiping other things, other gods, instead of the one true God. So it totally fits here. What are some of the false idols in your life? I bring that question up periodically, right? Time to do a heart check. What are some of the things that are being tempted to be false idols? 
take more of my attention. The community wasn't being warned against literally turning away to other gods, but was being warned to be true and pure in worship, to be on guard and ready and at peace and holiness for the final coming of God and all the days in between, to remember who you are worshiping and for what purposes, what it takes from us on a day-to-day -day basis and a week-to-week -week basis. What it takes from us in worship is always pursuing peace and holiness and focusing on God. If we struggle with, with pursuing peace and holiness, then we will struggle with worshiping God. And we will struggle with putting our focus on God. When we make worship anything other than pursuing this holiness and peace, we actually leave the realm of worship. All the parts of worship work together for us individually and collectively as a whole to, to make a whole presentation to God. If the pastor makes it all about them, that's not worship. If the music leaders make it all about them, that's not worship. If the congregation makes it all about them and how they're going to be served by others like the pastor and the music leaders, that's not worship. It's all of us putting in effort with all of our attention and hearts pointed toward God in heaven and God here with us right now through Christ and the Holy Spirit. And who can we struggle with that or what? I've had a lot of experiences over the years of leading worship. I've often said that if I were to write a book right now about worship and leading worship, it would be titled 1001 Ways and Counting that Matt said, well, I'll never do it that way again. <laughs> and, and the subtitle to it would read A Journey in Worship Where Matt Was Not Pursuing God and Holiness. There are times in my 24 years of leading worship that, that I've made it more about me than God. Bringing in the music, there are times in my 24 years of leading worship where I've observed congregations making it more about them than God in the form of, what are you going to give me today? It's all, as though we're all here as worship consumers. Consumers in worship rather than givers of ourselves and God. Ouch, right? But it's true. When have you been that person? Now, ah, what's worship going to do for me today? I need a boost. Or I need to feel something. That's going to be me. But here's the good news, too. We shouldn't let that stop us when that happens. Don't let that stop you if that has happened to you. You individually and us together in whole. A whole group. Because our whole pursuit of peace and holiness through worship is the goal. Look to the present and the future about how you are going to approach worship if you feel maybe that you've fallen short in the past. Maybe you fell short today. It's all right. You're in good company. Right? Learn from that. And move in a new and faithful direction. Your worship, your worship is perfect when you are pursuing these things in worship, holiness, peace, if all of us together are doing that, the sermon will be enough. The music will be enough. Music that you hear. The music that you yourself are producing. The prayers will be enough. The giving in the offering plates will be enough, which is also an act of worship. And, and people don't often enough view giving to the church as an act of worship of sacrifice, but it is. It is an act of worship. It's worship and sacrifice to God that blesses all of us in our ongoing ministry. Your sincere speaking voice and a call to worship, in greeting, in giving a smile to other people because it's all directed to, toward the Lord. It's enough. Your sincere voice and attention will be enough. You will see and experience the blaze of the burning bush, which at the same time is not burned up. That's true worship. That's the true halftime show that we give to God. I want to give another way to look at worship, how it's, how it's set up that, that I think will relate. 
It's more of a theater reference, but in the moment of the halftime show, what is, an, uh, what is an arena if not a gigantic theater? It's a reference that can help bring together Exodus, Hebrews, and all of us today, I think. Soren Kierkegaard, he was a philosopher in the 1880s, and he talked about a whole lot of things. And he talked about and thought about a whole lot of philosophy things, and some were about faith. John's probably cringing right now, John Young, a professor of philosophy. John, are you cringing somewhere right now because I just uh, gave a big gloss over? <laughs> but he talked about faith. He's actually an incredible thinker and writer about faith. I just want to get to the particular thoughts that he had about worship. In his mind about this theater, the arena, our arena is a theater, and inside the theater is a great stage, which might be the field for us. Normally, an audience at a theater is made up of people who, who have bought the tickets and are waiting for a performance. Here, in this model, the audience is God and God alone. We hear the actors and we perform acts and songs and praises to God, our sole audience. In Kierkegaard's model, the pastor is the director, and I don't really look at it that, that way when it comes to worship. If I have to look at worship in this kind of model, I look at it more like a, like a reader's theater. And I get to work with others and preparing weekly scripts and handing them out and helping give directions and guidance like in a form of bulletins when I get them right and everything is in order, right? But all of that coming together and, and all the while, I'm just a reader as well, loving to get to take part in it. And all of these parts come together for creative and ongoing worship services. That's a neat image, right? You're an actor on stage right now performing for God. But this is not acting in the form of pretending. It's sincere. You are acting as you, and God wants you to be you. Good model? You guys like that? It's interesting, right? Well, let's get back onto the field, okay? Let's get back onto the field and see what else comes up. I want to use a halftime show image of marching bands and, and being on the field and, and playing their hearts out. You guys like marching bands and watching marching bands? Yeah. <laughs> When you see the performers and all of this in worship, I can think of the great marching band. Because let's be honest, the halftime shows in the NFLs these days, they're probably not great examples to use. It's a lot of provocative clothing and dancing, incredibly self-centered and nothing but lip syncing to top it off. I do not want to promote a model of worship where we're all lip syncers, right? <laughs> I'm not approved, but let's stick with an awesome marching band for this image the way it was before the halftime show became so commercialized and sensationalized. It's much better. Every instrument on the field, different parts and different sounds all playing their part at once. Every individual has learned their steps to march in a specific pattern. And with everyone doing that at once, you get an incredible sound. You get an incredible formation and movement all working together in harmony, a sincere and valuable experience for everyone involved, whether someone is up in the stands and watching or on the field participating there. There will always be people in the stands who haven't made it to the field yet, even though they're welcome to. They're watching, observing, and generally, they know sincere worship when they see it. And especially in this digital age, they are vocal and call it out when they don't. One final point to make clear, to bring all of this together, to bring it home. Overall, for you, is worship a perform for an audience mentality or a worship of the congregation mentality? My worship professor on almost day one of our first worship class asked, when you worship, when you lead worship, he was asking a group of pastors, are you performing for an audience or are you worshiping with the congregation? Amen. Amen. That's a great question, right? Now, technically, these terms can be seen as synonyms, but when compared this way, there's an entire difference when we're thinking about our goals and hopes when it comes to worship and where our hearts are at. If I find myself in the performance and audience side, I really need to think again and change. We heard a word of choir up here today. Choir. If you 
you ever find yourself in the first category, I would challenge you to rethink that. I'm not saying that's automatically the case. Don't hear that I'm throwing out personal indictments. It's more warnings I'm offering here because worshiping God, keeping our focus on God in every turn, every note, every rhythm is so very important, right? Congregation, who's not part of the choir? Paul would want me to add, not yet part of the choir. <laughs> Congregation who is here, you know, not part of the choir. If you find yourself feeling like people, as people as performers for an audience, like people are performing for you, and your role is to passively receive it and clap afterwards, I challenge you to rethink that. If you feel like that you've come to perform for others, for worship, for any number of reasons, keeping up with the Joneses, looking good, whatever that looks like to you, I challenge you to rethink that. Because we're all here to worship God. And if performance is involved, and we use that word, it's for God. Not for each other. If we want to use the language of performance and audience, then God is our audience in this halftime show when we worship and we are tasked with continually striving to offer the absolute best performance that we can when we worship. And the best doesn't mean the best sounding, the most polished, the most on pitch, the loudest, the quietest, the most visible, the least. Visible. No, it means worshiping sincerely and celebrating with others who are worshiping. It's about marveling at the most off-pitched voice and seeing the beauty and pure worship that is not hindered by a lack of confidence of, oh, I better be quiet. I don't want other people to hear how I sound. And you've been misled if you've been taught to stifle your sincere worship for God. Or that it's a show that's unfolding before you and you're just a consumer. You've been misled if that's what you've been taught and that that's your view of worship. I apologize for that. Every week, don't worry, I'm landing the plane. <laughs> Every week, I'm lifting up different opponents. The opponents today are all the things that want to come into worship and be worshiped that aren't God. They are all the things that try to hinder you from coming into this worship space. That say, you don't have to remove your shoes. This isn't really holy ground. You're just, you know, you're coming together. You're going to give a few waves. You're going to say a few things. You're going to sing a few things. You're going to pray a few things. You're going to hear a few things that are, I don't know, hopefully relevant, make you feel good or something. And then you're just going to go back on your way afterward. That's your opponent. Your opponents are the things in your life and around you that try to keep you from pursuing peace and holiness, that keep you from worshiping God with the awe and the reverence that God deserves, that God asks us to acknowledge. Stand up to the opponents by removing your shoes, maybe literally, but probably metaphorically. Come into this place or any place in time of worship as though you are entering holy ground and you are filled with that anticipation to express your faith, to hear others' faith, and see what God is up to. Sing about the joy of worship. Sing about the joy of God. You've heard the next hymn that we're going to sing before, probably. But here's my final challenge to all of us, to prepare us to go back out to a world this pause, this halftime show. I challenge you to sing this song with a new heart, with a full heart, when you sing, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of heaven, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt, melt the clouds of sin and sadness, dry the dark of doubt, the way, the giver of immortal gladness. What do we sing? Fill us with light day. Doesn't that sound triumphant? I want us to sing it that way. I want us to raise the roof off of this place when we sing this hymn. I want us to strive to sing praise and sing this hymn louder than you've ever sung it before. My, my guess is that you've sung this hymn before, or at least parts of it. 
I want you to be challenged today to sing it right now in this place louder than you've ever sung it before with full hearts. Amen. 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 No one's actually letting out a balloon. It's because we have hair in the radiator lines. Boy, that was a derailment. <laughs> Should that hinder our worship? Should that hinder our joyful, joyful, we adore thee? Sing it loud and listen for others singing their hearts out like you because we all are pursuing peace and holiness and harmony with God. Are you ready? Ready. I can't wait to hear the message of worship in your heart come alive during our singing. Paula, will you lead us? Karen, will you lead us in this raucous and holy singing? Let's all stand in terms of 89. Amen. Joyful, joyful, we adore
take worship with 